This is the video for our Lesson 11 vocabulary words. Our first word is Genesis. Of course, you guys are thinking about our first book of the Bible, which would make sense. Here, though, we are not using it as a proper noun. You notice that we've got a lowercase g here, although the meanings are still going to be the same. An etymologist studies the history, development, and genesis of words. Since you guys have that biblical background, most likely you can figure this out without even looking at the sentence. But look at those words, history and development. Those are going to be your clues. Think of how something develops from the beginning to the end. So, of course, then Genesis means the beginning or origin of something. Of course, in the Bible, it's the beginning of life and creation. Synonyms would be start or birth. The opposite would be conclusion or finish. When we do the spelling for this on the quiz, make sure you don't capitalize the G, though, because we're not talking about the book of the Bible. Our next word is futile. Some people pronounce this futile, but the actual correct pronunciation is futile. This is an adjective. Tom felt like studying for his geometry test was futile because he would fail anyway. So the context clue strategy here is cause and effect, one thing leading to the other. Apparently this student is not any good at geometry and even if he takes the time to look over the material because he doesn't understand it, he's not going to have a good result. If something is futile, it's useless or pointless. Sometimes you might feel like it's futile to argue with your parents because they're not going to change their mind. Um, synonyms would be ineffectual or fruitless. The opposite would be effective or useful. Our next word is kindred. This is another adjective, kind of an old-fashioned word. Love at first sight talking about that with Romeo and Juliet, entails two people with kindred emotions, so kindred describing the type of emotion, who become instant soulmates. Soulmate is your clue here. If you have a kindred attachment to someone, you feel like you um, have a similar origin, you connect with each other, you have a similar nature, a similar character. Um, a synonym would be homogenous. The opposite would be disparate. Disparate would mean you have differing opinions on things. You can't come to a common agreement. Our next word is carp. Not the fish, but an action word. Students who always carp about the assignments their teachers give are an annoyance in the classroom. If you carp about something, you're complaining, but typically it's about something that's not very important. So it's petty or nagging. The, uh, a synonym would be grumble, also nag, nitpick. You might have friends who you feel like carp about things all of the time. Again, these are going to be issues that are small and not very important, trivial. And so it just gets quite annoying when people act this way. There are a lot bigger problems in the world. The opposite would be to praise or laud. Laud is a, a Latin word coming from the Latin. Our next word is lacerate. This is another verb. You might think of the noun form of this, laceration. The sentence here has to do with the dog causing an injury to the girl. The dog lacerated Marcy's nose, but at least it didn't break it. If something is lacerated, it means that the flesh, in this case the flesh on her nose, is torn in a jagged way. It's not an even cut. It's not a clean break. There are rips and tears. A lot of times this happens with glass. So if somebody is in a car accident and the windows of the vehicle shatter and the glass lands in the person's skin, they get lacerations. So sometimes you'll get, you'll read about the descriptions of a person's injury and you might see that term laceration, the noun form. Synonym would be to slash something, to gash it or rip it up. The opposite would be suture. Suture is another word for stitch. So you're, you're closing it up instead of tearing it. 
Our next word is Q. This is actually a British word, but it's being used more and more in American culture. And this can be used as a noun or a verb. This is a noun in this sentence. When you are on hold as, a, as caller number 12 in a phone queue, your wait can seem endless. You know, if you're calling a customer service, customer service for a store and you're put on hold, you're in the queue, and then when your number comes up, the operator on the other end answers. We see queues at Disney World when you're waiting in line for the rides. Some of you might have a Netflix queue where you have a lineup of the movies or TV shows that you want to watch. When you use it as a verb, you would say, we are going to queue up now. Again, more often used in British culture, but coming more and more into our American culture. So the noun, the uh, noun definition would be a line of people or vehicles. We have a queue of cars outside in car line for lower school and uh, middle school here at the end of the day and even in the morning. Our next word is immaculate. Hopefully you know what this means already. The sentence is a little bit interesting. On December 23, 1972, Franco Harris, famous football player of the Pittsburgh Steelers, made an amazing catch of a football that became known as the Immaculate Reception. You could Google this play. It's pretty amazing. Um, immaculate as an adjective here. We're describing his catch. It's actually, this sentence is a play off of the Immaculate Conception, which is part of Catholic theology, the Immaculate Conception, not of Christ. It's, that's typically a mistake here. It's, it's actually referring to the Virgin Mary. But Immaculate means clean, spotless, perfect, holy, pure. So this catch would be just the perfect catch, a textbook catch that you might see in um, old film archives for the NFL. NFL. Typically we use it for talking about cleanly, cleanliness though. Your mom might say to you, when I get back I expect your room to be immaculate. The opposite would be dirty, soiled, or spotted. Our next word is flagrant, kind of similar to blatant, which we had last week. And again, it's an adjective. It's the flagrant errors, describing errors here, you can usually spot right away. The subtle ones are often tougher to detect. So here we have our opposite context clue. The opposite of flagrant is subtle. If something is subtle, it's hard to detect. Flagrant, though, is very obvious. In fact, it's glaringly bad. It's outrageous. A synonym would be offensive, shameless, or brazen. Next is fracas. A lot of times people look at this and they think it's pronounced fracas, but it's actually a long A, fracas, and it's a noun. Here's an example of how it's used. When it is hot, competition is fierce and tempers are short and there's often a fracas on the practice field. I don't know if that's happened here at Southside in summer practice for football or, you know, August, September when it's really hot and people might get angry. But a fracas is just a kind of a fancier word for a fight. A loud quarrel or a fight, a synonym would be brawl. We're going to see a fracas in Romeo and Juliet. In fact, several of them. Fracas, a fracas happens right at the beginning of the play between the servants of the Capulets and the Montagues. And then Tybalt and Benvolio get involved. And even Lord Capulet and Lord Montague want to get involved, although their wives hold them back. Fracas. Our next word is nefarious. This is an adjective. It's easy to figure it out because of the example that's given here. Stalin and Hitler are generally considered to be the most nefarious despots, using one of our words earlier. Remember, that's a dictator of the 20th century. So obviously, this is going to have a negative connotation when we're talking about Stalin and Hitler. So this word means very wicked, notorious. Notorious means famous, but famous for something evil or bad, not famous for something good. So synonyms would be villainous, despicable. The opposite would be reputable. If somebody has a reputable opinion of you, that means they think highly of you. Your reputation is a good one. And then honest, of course, would be a, another antonym. Next is query. Jenny queried her mom 
about whether or not she could go see into the woods. Queried is just a little bit fancier of a word for questioned. And so then the noun form would be query. We're using it as a verb here. Either way is fine though if I use this for your sentence on your quiz next week. If you want to use it as a noun, you can. To ask or inquire though is the verb form. She's asking her mom if she can go to the movies to see this production or to the theater if it's the Broadway production. Synonym would be question um, and also interrogate which you might use in a police station or maybe you feel like your parents often interrogate you about what you've been up to. Our next word is patrician. You might have heard this word in history with Mrs. Corey. In England, patricians are found in the House of Lords. So we're talking about Parliament, but we're talking about kind of the upper house. And we're talking about people who are aristocrats or noble. Most of the time, they're obviously going to be wealthy. We're going to see this, for those in honors, we're going to see this in Julius Caesar. Um, the opposite is commoner. You might have also heard of the term plebeian. Those are the people on the bottom of society, just the everyday common person. In Julius Caesar, for again, for those in honors, kind of the middle of the play we're going to see a group of plebeians who are coming into the play because they are very upset about the assassination of Caesar. Next would be facade not facade. <laughs> this is a French word so that C sounds like an S. These days men and women can buy the facade they want from their plastic surgeons and that's true all the time we see before and after pictures typically of um, people who are famous but a facade is something that's not genuine it's a deceptive outward appearance in this sentence the person isn't really who they are because the plastic surgeon has changed the way they look it's a misrepresentation synonyms would be pretense or charade if you put on a charade you're pretending to be somebody who you're not just think of the game charades um, Sometimes we use facade in this context. You might say, the girl put on a facade of happiness, although she was very upset inside. So she, she was pretending to be happy, but yet on the inside, she's actually very upset about something. Our next word is gate. This is also a noun. He had an unusual side-to-side -side gate that made him easy to spot. Gate really is just the way you walk, your manner of walking. Synonym is walk. I know the gate of everyone in my family. If I'm at home by myself and I hear someone come in through the garage and they're walking down the hallway, I can tell by the way they walk through the sound of their footsteps if it's my husband or if it's my daughter or if it's my son. And I'm sure you can identify the gate of your family members and friends as well. Our next word is emissary. This is a noun. Emissaries must be skilled in the art of diplomacy. So diplomacy typically is when we're talking about countries dealing with other countries. So we have people in America who work for the government and their job is to communicate with the governments of nations around the world. And so we typically have one or two emissaries for each country. And oftentimes they actually live in that country. The word you're probably most familiar with that is a synonym for this term is an ambassador. So the definition though is one sent on a special mission to represent others, an ambassador or an agent. This is our last word for this lesson. Don't forget to put your honor pledge on exercise one for lesson 17 or lesson 11.